that teacher voice and everything. I like it. Live now. All right, live and recording. Thank you for joining everybody. I'm Guy McPherson and Pauline Schneider, the other member of the Nature Bats last channel is there on screen in the little screen. Meanwhile, skipper Kevin Hester is with me on the big screen. <laughs> Kevin has hosted several of my trips to New Zealand to go on speaking tours and not just to visit beautiful New Zealand. And thanks to everybody from joining along. And we are receptive to all your questions. I would encourage you, if you have not already read or watched the Monday video, which was what was it, science snippets, the rate of environmental change. And the text is included at the bottom of the blog post at guymcpherson.com. So you can read it or you can mute yourself and watch the eight or 10 minute version of it. So this is an, an ask me anything sort of approach. And in this case, ask us anything. So that's where we're going to start. Kevin, you want to say a word or two? The two things that are um, drawing most of my focus at the moment are the Arctic sea ice and where it's going. And obviously it's going down the Google like us. And then the second thing is that we it looks like we're in the early stages of a transition from a triple dip La Nina, which is pretty much unheard of. And we're waiting to see if we're going to transit into either a neutral phase or an El Nino. And the El Nino scares the living daylights out of me because I think we'll see a step change in um, the consequences of the oceans letting so much of that stored heat back into the atmosphere. Um, I hope uh, everyone can hear me all right. There's a, a good old storm raging outside, as chance would have it. So uh, the, the weather's turned up. Let people know this is live. I'm I can't hear the storm, so that's all working great. Um, <laughs> this this is live, everybody on YouTube, and also recorded for future distribution on YouTube. So, if you don't want your face showing, you can turn it off. If you do want your face showing, that's fine too, because nobody's got an uglier face than Kevin. Had, I mean, than me. So, <laughs> you, you got no competition here. So fire away, ask us a question. You can send it through the chat and Pauline can read it for us or summarize it for us. Or I think you can just talk, right, Pauline? They can just talk, well, raise their hand. Well, people who are in the Zoom are our members and uh, they get first dibs. Okay. <laughs> Somebody raise their hand on the far right on my Michael. screen. Michael Dowd. I'm guessing you have a question. Sure. Well, in many of your videos, you have it dispersed in a lot of different places, but I'm just wondering if you could share here uh, in this recording, what are some of the practices or mindsets or exercises? Like, what are some of the tools that you and Pauline use to not just tolerate or grieve but to actually live full out and joyously and with gratitude and not that sort of thing like one of the a lot of people are coming to collapse awareness but that that's painful as we all know but collapse acceptance and beyond that things like gallows humor and things that you've spoken to so anything that you'd be willing to share about y'all's practices and just the things that may that help you maintain a positive spirit and a joyous life in the midst of otherwise really challenging, depressing stuff. Right. That's a fine and fair question. One of the first activities we did together was participate in a grief recovery workshop in Phoenix, Arizona, that 
going through that workshop enabled us to view our current and past relationships through a certain lens. It's called the grief recovery workshop because most of us have experienced grief. Many people don't even know what that means. I didn't know what it meant until I participated in this workshop. And that was in 2014. So I was 54 years old at that time. And I didn't have a clue what grief really was. Within the first few hours of the workshop, I figured out based on the definition that grief recovery folks use, that I had been experiencing grief. Grief, according to those people, is wishing for a different past. And I really like that definition because it brought to mind the experiences I'd had with my immediate family that for many years had thrown me for a loop, had me very concerned, had me confused about what was going on. I was, I was still living in that wishing for a different past with people who had always indicated their love for me elsewhere in my life. And then suddenly they didn't. And so I was still thinking that I was in that past situation. Well, I was able to, as a result of the grief recovery workshop, I was able to go through some relatively straightforward exercises that changed my relationship to many people so that I didn't have the same relationship with them. I still had a relationship with them, but it wasn't the same as it was before because what's the point when somebody doesn't have the same feelings for you that you have for them and they haven't for a long time, then there's not much point in hanging on to that relationship that's already over. It's like the girlfriend you had when you were a sophomore in high school, right? That's behind us now and we can move on. And with some relatively straightforward exercises, it was pretty easy to do that. In addition, I've been adhering to most of the principles of modern Stoicism for a long time, since I was on campus 15 or so years ago. And so that enables me to focus on the, th the things that are reasonable to respond to and the things that aren't. And there's a lot of things that come my way that I could easily respond to and it would make for a much worse day for me. So I don't. And so that, at least from my perspective, that allows me to work on the relationships that matter, most notably the one with Pauline, who I share a home with and a life. And, you know, it took a long time to get to this point and I, I feel bad for people who haven't had the opportunities that I've had to figure out how to deal with things that you don't have any control over and to differentiate between those things that you can respond positively to and the things that you just did. There's no point. It, it took me many years to get here. And so I feel bad for millennials, for example, and younger people who are facing loss of habitat for our species already around the planet. And that's a process that's only accelerating. And they're confused. They All they've ever heard from this entire society is every generation gets things better than the previous generation because of technology. And of course, an expanding money supply, but that's not the way this is turning out. So I feel kind of bad about that. It's one of those things I can't do much about. Pauline, did you want to weigh in? Um, yeah, thanks. Well, one of the ways that I cope is well, my, my friends help, my kids help. Right. Pauline, it looks like you're on mute, but actually I hear you. Yeah. I don't know. I Because Guy's computer. Oh, I see. Right, right, right. Got it, got it. Got it. So yep, yep. It's actually okay. better that way. <laughs> okay, good. Yes. Um, okay. Well, now I can't. Okay. <laughs> I am muted. 
Jeez, technology. Yeah, so I think that, you know, having done the grief recovery workshop really helped and then sharing that with other people. This year has been a really tough year. My sister died in September and um, it was, it's one of those terrible situations where there was a lot of miscommunication with the entire family. So there's a lot of things that were un that were left unsaid. There were things left unsaid, and there was not adequate closure. So that's a problem with people losing each other, trying to make sure that you're going to be in a good place as we go forward. At you know, as the climate continues to collapse around us, you just need to know that. Every day could be someone's last day. And yesterday, a good friend of ours sent us a text that her mom died. Mm. And it wasn't, you know, out of the blue, but it's still, you know, your, it's your mom. Mm -hmm. it was, uh, and this is somebody who's several years younger than us. Mm -hmm. So her, her mom must be younger than than my mom is. She was 81. Yeah. yeah. It wasn't like a spring chicken or anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that we're all dealing with a, a variety of trauma from childhood, from regular life, from things that we're anticipating. So it's important that we try to hold on to some sort of playfulness in our mm -hmm. practice. Um, even just doing the mundane things can be uh, meditative, calm, doing laundry, cleaning something. That can be a part of your meditation. Yeah. And that's, that's what I do. And, yeah. and bear in mind that several years ago, I came up with stage six of Elizabeth Kubler Ross's Five Stages of Grief, and that's Gallows Humor. Oh, I know. I've given you credit for that. I mention that almost every time I talk about that. And, you know, it's easier for some folks than others, obviously. Some of us are naturally inclined to be wise asses. As I say, better be a wise ass than a dumbass. Carrie. Kevin, Kev, Kevin, 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 I'm, Kevin, I'm curious. Do you have any responses to that? Things that have supported you in staying positive or at least relatively positive and not, you know, tormented by grief or anger or whatever? Yeah, um, my situation is I live in paradise. I look out the window about where I live on this tiny little island in the Hauraki Gulf in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and it's just magical. I could see, I can see orca and dolphins without lifting my head off my pillow if I want to in the morning, if they happen to be there at the right time. But also, I've had so many brushes with death that I feel like I've been on borrowed time all my adult life. So you know, as you can see, that's a very long time. So I've had a lot more time on this beautiful planet than I ever expected to have. And I've had some interesting experiences with hospice and I know you can do hospice well and you can say goodbye to people well. Um, when Guy and I had our, our radio show, Next Bats Last, on PRN.FM, we had the opportunity to interview Stephen Jenkinson a few times. Uh, he wrote that book, the Grief, the Grief Walker, and Guy Wise. And he's an absolutely wonderful philosopher. And I think having people like that and Michael Dowd, I will say you, having people like you in my life makes it easier because it's honest. The conversations we have are honest. And that's not what most people are getting with their bourgeois friends who are pretty much in denial about the, the severity and the rapidity of how this is unfolding. I, I made a, a, a video recently about the, the speed of change. And I think it's a critical issue we need to get into people's heads. Yeah, that's uh, great. Uh, another line from Edward Abbey, three sentences comes to mind. Life is too short for grief or regret or bullshit. I like that. Wow. Carrie, Carrie has a question in the chat. Pauline, can you summarize that for us? 
which chat? Oh, care in which chat, babe? Is there more than one? Well, yes, I'm looking at the YouTube chat. And oh, this is, it's in the meeting chat. chat. All right. I'm going to ask uh, you guys to help with the Zoom chat while I manage the YouTube live chat. Okay. Carrie, who has an unpronounceable last name, says, I'm spending about five hours a week as an activist. It's clear that I'm wasting my time. When I stop, I feel like I should be trying anyway, and I go back. How do I quit? Should I quit? I could be spending time with my grandkids and playing guitar, and I work 50 hours a week. Well, even the IPCC admits, and this is a very conservative, politically oriented body, even they admit that we're in the midst of abrupt, irreversible climate change, and this has been the case for a few years with two separate reports. It's not going to get any better. If even the IPCC indicates that it's not going to get any better, then I think that's a pretty good assessment that it's not going to get any better. Uh, if you if you don't enjoy your activism, then I wouldn't do it. You know, there there are some people in Extinction Rebellion who are just insisting that young people get arrested and go to jail. And I think that's absolutely absurd. I would never encourage young youngsters to spend time in jail. That's a miserable place, miserable place to be. And it's too late to stop this train. The train has left the station a long time ago. I would argue that the train left the tracks quite a while ago and is headed down, down into the abyss. So if you don't enjoy what you're doing from this perspective of act activism or your work or anything else, I would try to improve the situation. If that means not being an activist, fine. If that means working fewer hours, fewer hours than you're working right now, and you can get away with that, why not? Life is short. Even if we have until 2030 and we don't, life is short. Why, why aren't you spending your time with your grandkids. Kevin, you want to weigh in? I'm, I'm totally cool with um, adults and especially my generation being staunch on de demonstrations and taking the risk of going to jail. In a way, us being sent to jail would be poetic um, justice because of the way we've let down the youth so miserably. But what I would prefer the youth to do is I'd rather they went surfing or hiking or diving and not go to jail because it's just not a productive... You know, all this talk about getting the government to do something. What the actual fuck could they or would they do? That is just a complete waste of energy. And also it's diversionary, and I think that's... Um, I think that's dishonest. Yeah, we're in the midst of abrupt irreversible climate change. There's nothing the government can do about that. Exactly. I, I like what Dr. Gabor Namate says, Gabor Mate, accepting inevitability. And he says it in response to palliative care and hospice care, but it applies to us as well accepting inevitability. The inevitable situation is that we're all going to die. And it's gonna be a lot sooner than most people can imagine. Accept it, deal with it, get on with your life. There are things you still want to do, right? And remember, there's no playbook for this. None of our ancestors went through this existential risk. This is a completely new ball game, and I think that's why we should try and find tribes members to share this time with. You know, you and me and Pauline have become the fastest, strongest friends through this story. Right. And I think that's something that we can all do. We can look for comrades to to share our grief with and to share our joy and and and. And pleasure with. That's what I would like people to do. Have fun. Make the most of everything. Make the most of every minute. And, and if we're wrong, 
if the IPCC is wrong, if all the scientists are, that I quote are wrong, and we actually have until 2035, I don't think you're going to be annoyed that you spent your time in a positive way with other people. Exactly. Cool. Some science questions. Science questions? Go fire away. Well, Daniel's also had his hand up for quite a while. Well, you should put it in. <laughs> <laughs> Go, Daniel. Yes, hi. I, I really appreciate uh, the question and the answer you guys gave. Beautiful. Um, you know, we're in a crisis, and in a crisis, the people that keep their heads are the people that are in it helping out. This is my view. I think if activism is your thing, I would get busy helping my neighbors, friends, family, everyone I know with anything, just anything, make their day a little better. Stay involved. Um, if you do, you'll, you'll keep your sanity through the whole thing, I have no doubt. But I had a science question. <laughs> um, Okay, <clears throat> the ice at the poles is, is melting at an increasingly accelerating rate. We have tons and tons of fresh water pouring into the oceans. Is the AMOC slowing down? Are we about to see it stop? If it did stop, what would happen? That's I, don't think, I don't think we're gonna see it stop. It would surprise me very much because there's too, too much inertia on the side of warming. And if it does, it'll get very cold in Western Europe and probably Northeastern Canada, maybe even Northeastern United States. But I, I suspect we're too far down the road of warming the planet to have that outcome occur. But I don't, we don't know. You know, there's a lot, as, as somebody writes me every day, the climate is a complicated system and we don't know every detail. But actually, for, for, me, I think, for me, I think the most relevant aspect of the AMOC, the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation slowing down is the effect it's having on the jet streams and letting all this cold air bleed out of the Arctic. That's an accelerating feedback that no one's really delving into. Right, and so that would lead to an even faster loss of habitat around the world for humans and other animals. Yeah, I've had some people try to argue that the ice ages are coming back, but they don't realize there's never ever been that we have evidence of an ice age uh, coming when part carbon parts per million have been over 250 much less 400. Right. Colleen, did you have other questions? Yes. So let's see, we've got uh, Jimmy Greer, who is also a huge Batman, uh, says, asks uh, if you've heard of the worms vanishing um, and the warmer nights shutting crops down. Uh, he what, what was the first thing? The worms. Oh, the worms. Oh, yeah. He's been looking for earthworms and he can't find them. He's in Georgia. I think I got that right. And um, he's having a hard time finding any earthworms. I, I mean, I see earthworms here, but not as many as you would expect either. Right. And I wrote about this on the blog, I think, in Extinction Foretold, Extinction Ignored, with a link to earthworms disappearing. And maybe did a video quite a while ago about it. But yes, this has been written up in the peer-reviewed literature that the earthworms are going away. And that obviously has negative consequences for food production. Okay. Um... I had a, a big team of planters come out to the island, planting the trees that we propagate at the Rakino Island Nursery. And one of them said to me that he'd been doing this job for a quarter of a century and he, he saw orders of magnitude, more worms on our rock than anywhere else that he's been planting. And that just goes to show how denuded 
the land, the soil has become in so many places that that would jump out at someone like that. I was just beaming. It was so hilarious. I'm walking around a big grin on my face because I've got so many worms. <laughs> have to be the right kind of worms. <laughs> um, we also have a question about the, um, let's see, where is it? Okay, thoughts on the Hanson et al. 10C locked-in preprint. Will it ever pass peer review? This is uh, aerosol masking is asking this. That's a great <laughs> YouTube name, by the way. <laughs> of course we could hit 10C. Remember, this is the man who said my idea about near-term human extinction was, quote, crazy. <laughs> and I think it's, especially if we're starting with the 1750 baseline. And so we're already at more than 2C above the 1750 baseline. So could we hit 10? Sure. I mean, that's, there, there have been 10 degree swings in the past with the highest temperature of the planet in the last 2 billion years being recorded at just about 23 C, and the lowest temperature about 12 C. And we're currently just over 15 and a half C. So it's possible. Uh, will, it, will it ever be published? Probably because Hansen's name is on it. And I suspect several other colleagues as well because he is quick and generous with sharing authorship on his work. But also he'll try to make it sound like it's going to happen in 2100 or 2090 right. or 80 or 70 or 60 or 50 or 40 or 30 when we're watching it unfold now. Right. It's clear the acceleration now. I got a kick out of the commentary on that when the first announcement came out, all this techno geoengineering silliness, like, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. This is why I so much appreciate this one page paper by Mark C. Urban that was in science called Life Without Ice. And it's really interesting because he points out that life without ice means the, in, in the very near term, a trillion tons of carbon dioxide equivalent being poured into the atmosphere. When so far since the industrial revolution, we're at about 35, uh, 36.5 or 36.6 billion tons. Now we're talking about a trillion tons shortly after we have the first ice free Arctic. It's really interesting because, you know, he writes this as if he's writing about going to school when he was 12, just very matter of factly. And he, he of course says that it's decades away. An ice-free Arctic Ocean is decades away, but that's not the situation we have according to Professor Jennifer McKenna or Professor Emeritus James Anderson, the latter at Harvard. So they both indicate that it's gonna happen this year. We'll know a lot in early April when the U.S. Naval Postgraduate School puts out their six-month ensemble forecast. So we'll see where that takes us. And we'll have a pretty good cool idea then about whether or not we're going into an El Nino around That's the same right. time. Right. <laughs> Talk about the perfect storm. Sure. Sorry, Michael, I spoke over you. Go ahead. Please. No, no, no. I was just saying that Renee Wendy had her had her hand up. Go, Renee. Oh, okay. Well, um, I just I just pulled up that Mark Urban article and I saw a polar bear walking across it. And um, as I recently um, wrote about, the polar bears are doing all right because they're very closely related to the grizzly bears and they are moving on land and mating with the grizzlies and adopting a different kind of habitat. And I'm thinking about how many human species we killed off, um, thereby kind of bottlenecking 
are opportunities for uh, different genetics and how many knowledge systems we killed off, you know, bottlenecking ourselves into this technological knowledge system. And so I like to really, um, I mean, I think, but my question for you is, so I guess I want the answer to be, okay, my question is, you can give the answer yeah. first, and then you can ask a question. That okay. way, it will be easier for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I want to think that humans could change things right now if they wanted to, but we're too stupid to. So, my question for you is: theoretically, if we didn't have to deal with human psychology and dynamics and so forth, is it theoretically possible that things could be turned around from a technological only standpoint? I mean, at some point in the past, that must have been true. So that's that's my question for you. And and the answer is yes, according to every paid climate scientist, every media personality, and every government official. I just oh. want to show the picture you were talking about. I think the point of this picture mm -hmm. is that the polar bear is jumping around from ice flow to ice flow with lots of open water between. Yeah. And... I strongly suspect it's too late because we're so far down the road of planetary warming. Yeah. And it takes so much to reverse that. You know, had governments or wealthy people shown any interest when Dr. Ye Tao came up with his mere reflection framework five years ago, then that would have been something. And I, I think five years ago, we might have had time had we made an investment it might have been time to stop the warming and maybe even reverse it. But nobody, is, nobody who matters with respect to governments and wealth has demonstrated any interest in the five years that he's been touting that program he came up with. So I suspect even if we start last week, it's still too late. But And especially uh, not if we all just keep going to war like the European <laughs> pact. The consequences of this European war is it's like there's a whole new, huge country of emissions on the planet that is in no calculations. It's not in the IPCC. It's no in no one's calculation. Yeah. I, can, I, can I jump in on that one? Yes. My sense is that uh, Renee, that that's not possible because I see the four main drivers of collapse, ecocide, and likely near-term human extinction as being civilization itself, human-centered civilization itself, progress and technology, or progress, progress and development, let's just say, progress and development. Science and technology is actually a driver. It's actually a cause because it's been trying to control nature for human benefit. And then market right. economics. So those four things civilization, progress and development, science and technology, and, and, and market economics tend to be four of the main things that are driving ecocide and have actually throughout human history. I only take issue with science as a driver. Science is a way of knowing. Technology, yes. The products of science are- The application of science, yes. Exactly. But science itself is just a way of knowing, a way of understanding what's going on in the universe. So that's not- driving anything negative as nearly as I can tell. But yeah, the I mean, the, the application of science in the in the in the trying to control nature is what I meant. Yes, yeah, science as a way of knowing that's not the problem. But science in service of technology that thinks that it can control nature for human benefit without becoming food for other creatures at the end of its life, that clearly is a problem. Right. Well, I wanted to make a short comment about the worms in my yard. I moved into a house that's been in my family for uh, oh about 40 years and nothing's been done to the yard at all except mowing it and and uh and then it bakes in the sun all summer long so it's basically a a dead zone that gets a few weeds in the winter um and i started to make a habitat for bugs and animals because that's what feels nice for me to do right now and i find when i dig into the soil it is chalk full of worms because it's been left alone. And I think that's so nice to have a piece of, if there's one thing I'm really fortunate, I have a piece of ground here that has been left alone for decades. And 
and let to do its own thing. And, and so it has developed a very nice ecosystem without anybody knowing about it. Um, and I think that's something that um, is definitely left out of our drive to fix the problem is how important it is to leave things alone. Right. Right. If you if you can dump a bunch of glyphosate on there, you can probably turn that around. Um, be be at the uh, exclusion zone around Chernobyl. Um, reiterated exactly what you said. A whole lot of um, wildlife is existing in in that environment, but of course, you know, it's doing incredible genetic damage, and that would have been the long term problem that. Um, all the radionuclides is damaging our, our genome. So it's a short-term benefit, what's happening in uh, the Chernobyl exclusion zone. That's nice to hear about, though. That's very nice. Another thing that goes on in the gardens is people use Roundup for glyphosates. Mm -hmm. And as we're discovering, those aren't good for people, and they must not be good for worms either. So... I'm sure that, you know, that's like one of those forever chemicals. So I remember them saying, oh, it's harmless. Right. right. Not. That's what I always heard. Not good for bees either. No, really bad. Terrible. Um, we have some more questions. If Fire away. Like. All right. So um, are we due for an El Nino this year? And if yes, I mean, we kind of, you know that that's coming, but what are the immediate impacts that we could face? Will wet bulb temperatures, will we hit wet bulb temperatures in parts of the world? I, I guess that's what you're trying to say. Well, we already are hitting wet bulb, lethal wet bulb temperatures around the world in tropical and subtropical regions and have been for several years. It, it was happening when we were living in Belize. And people were exhibiting behaviors consistent with organ failure. Mm -hmm. So it's already happening. Will it continue? Things are not going to get any better, folks. George Carlin had that right when at the end of his career, he said, everything's going to get worse. Nothing is going to get any better. This is just the situation we're stuck with. And now I went on that biblical rant for so long i forgot what the first part of the question was <laughs> but I, I want to point out something about wet bulb temperatures uh i had a blog post on my website uh saying wet bulbs seem to be the leading cause of death on the planet and that was spaced around the, the science at the time saying that 35 degrees c with um very high humidity was the wet bulb limit. But recent science has come out and has revived that, revised that down to 31C. This is a quantum leap. And right. these are the kind of quantum leaps that we're seeing all the time. Yeah. Um, I want to do a quick shout out. There's a couple of shout outs I want to make. Um, Mark Costins, I don't know if you're still on, but um, he's been a member for 29 months, rock star. Um, and he's one of McSpe McPherson's champions. Excellent. Thank you, Mark. And, uh, and Tim is on. No way. Big shout out to Tim. Hey, Tim. Thanks for joining the show. <laughs> on, on the and topic thanks for supporting us so much that you have over the years, Tim. It's and for anyone who uh, don't know about Tim, he has uh, his own YouTube channel, Tim, and it's done a, he's done a lot of fantastic editing of Guy's work and some of my work as well. Good dude. Yeah, yeah I think you can find the link in the channels tab on Guy's um, page. Like, you know. Yes. Yes, on the Nature Bats last YouTube page. Yeah, you can find the things that we watch as well. Yes. With respect to lethal wet bulb temperatures, there's this paper in the Open Access Nature Communications. It's open access, so anybody can read it. And it's from June 15th, 2021. It's called Significant Underestimation of Radiative Forcing by Aerosol Cloud Interactions Derived from Satellite-Based Methods. And the bottom line is, in the abstract, by accounting for the sampling biases, the magnitude of 
the aerosol cloud interactions, the, the wet bulb temperatures, in other words, increases by 55% globally, 133% over land, and 33% over ocean when we lose aerosols. 133% over land. Well, that's where most of us live. And so if we're at two now, we know we're, that we're above two. But if it's going to go up 133%, that means we're, that's another two plus about a half. So we're at four and a half in five days, according to James Hansen in several interviews and presentations. Talk about a rate of environmental change that's a little too fast for our, for most organisms to keep up with. That's the very definition of it. And industrial crops will be completely and utterly decimated with that level of change. Well, Richard Gerald mentioned that the bulletin of the atomic scientists yesterday moved the doomsday clock to 90 seconds to midnight. So I want to comment about that because the bulletin is very, very heavily weighted on the nuclear issue. Absolutely. Not, not climate change. So very little of that change that they, you know, they brought it into that 90 seconds is um, not even considering the existential, not yeah, pretty much not considering the existential threat of climate change. Right. So it's very optimistic. Yes. 90 seconds is optimistic. <laughs> I like to describe us as being like Thelma and Louise. We're all chatting after we've gone off the cliff. Right, We're in right. the free fall stage. Uh, yep. We're like the wily coyote with his feet still spinning. Um, some but more we're questions? Not, we're not nearly as resilient as Wiley Coyote, by the way. No, he could, he could take a punch. What is we do fantasy well, though. Right. <laughs> Ryan Minga asks, what is the possibility of an ice-free Arctic in 2023? Well, high. Very high, I'd say. Jennifer McKinnon, who's at the University of California, San Diego, and also at the Scripps Institution, not the Scripps Institute, but a subset of it called the Scripps Institution, and James Han Anderson, Harvard atmospheric scientist, famous for discovering the link between chlorofluorocarbons and the ozone hole in the Antarctic. He, he says in an interview with Forbes on January 15th, 2018, he said, Quote, the chance there will be permanent ice in the Arctic after 2022 is essentially zero, end quote. And Jennifer McKinnon said that she expects it this year as well. But she, at the time, and let's see, her interview was in CBS News on April 23rd, 2021. She said she expected it to happen last year, but it might be this year instead. So those are pretty reliable sources. Um, she was interviewed by CBS News upon release of a paper that she lead authored in, uh, where was it? it? Her paper was also in Nature Communications. Now, the, the two leading peer-reviewed sources in the natural sciences are put out by nature, including nature communications, and by science. And more recently, they added to their flagship journal science with science advances. So if you're seeing peer-reviewed literature come out of science advance, advances, in, or science advances, sorry, science advances, or any of the nature series, that's very conservative, and to reach conclusions in those journals requires considerable evidence. So I strongly suspect we're headed for a nice free Arctic this September. But we'll see. In early April, the U.S. Naval Postgraduate School will have their six-month ensemble forecast, and then we'll know with great certainty 
whether it will be an ice-free Arctic this fall or not. This fall in the Northern Hemisphere. And if the uh, El Nino kicks in, the likelihood is a very much higher. It's not a little bit more likely, it's infinitely more likely under an El Nino uh, scenario. That's the question I forgot to answer earlier. The consequences of an El Nino Southern Oscillation are to release a lot of heat and a lot of greenhouse gases from the ocean. So that's a short-term consequence that will have long-term ramifications. Uh, Peter Kataya asks about the marine plankton being at risk of going extinct. Uh, he says it's responsible for 70 of the oxygen. I think he means 70%, but it's actually more like 40%. Yeah, I've seen various figures, but or, or, I mean I'm 50% is yeah. in the neighborhood in any event. Yeah. But it could it could even be 80%. Well, yeah, because we're destroying the rainforest. <laughs> That's the other source. Right. So he's wondering how soon this could happen and could this alone cause collapse? Um, loss of oxygen. Loss of phytoplankton. Right. right. And plankton generally. Yes, of course. And as the ocean continues to warm faster than organisms can keep up, that's certainly what we're going to see more of. We've already lost an enormous amount of plankton that used to be in the ocean. So, and that's supported by peer reviewed findings. So, this shouldn't be a big surprise that that's one of the ways we are flushing our own toilet. And of course, photosynthesis stops after 35 degrees C. Right. So, as we heat up our forests, they're not going to be putting out much oxygen either. Right. And they become emitters, not um, sinks. Yep. Turning our sinks into sources isn't such a great idea. Uh, Russell asks, um, I have to sort of try to interpret this question. Um, state chattel are conditioned to alarm when it's, quote, too late. Uh, and that's a quote from 1979, Charney, report to POTUS on greenhouse gases. He asks, how about water vapor from the Tonga eruption a year ago? I don't understand the question. Water vapor is a greenhouse gas with a very short self-reinforcing feedback loop. So as water vapor increases, it acts as a lens that causes increased heating, which causes more water vapor to be driven up into the atmosphere. Was but, there a lot of water vapor when Tonga Yes, when, when Tonga yeah. went off, there was a lot of water vapor. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what the short or long-term consequences have been or will be. I haven't followed that closely at all. Kevin, do you know anything about that? Um, some of that water vapor was injected into the stratosphere. And well, I saw um, a discussion about how it would affect the hydroxyl radicals. And, you know, that's what breaks down the methane. So this is the whole thing. We're just changing the chemistry of the atmosphere at such an extraordinary level that there is no, no analog for this. We, we've never conducted this experiment before. We've got no idea what the ultimate implications will be. Very true. Probably worse than expected, though, if I had to guess. That's the only constant in our lives anymore. Right. Other questions, Polly? Tommyist asks, is it true that there will be an almost immediate tenfold increase in extreme weather events around the world after the Arctic Ocean becomes ice-free? I've I've not seen that tenfold figure, so I can't even comment. Kevin, have you seen that? No, I haven't seen a number like that. But of course, it will ramp up. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Cyclones form when the water, the ocean temperature is above twenty six C. So twenty six point one, you can get cyclone. You can get shit, big shitstorms lower than that. 
But as we heat up the oceans, and you've done work on this recently as well about the ocean heat content going up. So, of course, that will fuel the superstorms that are James Henson called the storms of my grandchildren. Right. 2022 was the had the warmest ocean in history, breaking the record of 2021. This based on a video, was that Monday or last week? I can't remember. Very recently, anyway. Uh, on a, on a peer-reviewed paper with 24 or 25 authors. Someone's asking a very interesting question that initially you might not think is a climate-based one, but it's more of a, so a social one. Um, because he says, what Mohammed uh, Omar Zia, I hope I pronounced your name correctly, what do you guys think about Ted Kaczynski's view regarding industrial society? Well, it's interesting. The publisher sent me a copy of Ted Kaczynski's latest book when it came out. And I read it. I can't remember the name of the book now because that was eight or 10 years ago, maybe six. Anyway, it's been a while. And it, on the one hand, it was right on. He acknowledges that industrial civilization is a disaster that is contributing to further disasters. What he didn't know about was the aerosol masking effect. So, of course, he didn't comment on that. As a consequence, he was taking a, an uninformed view of industrial activity. He was suggesting that we just shut it all down and that fix all our problems. Well, now we know better. So he was an, an early leader in the deep green resistance action assessment. And if you don't understand aerosol masking, and also if you don't understand that nuclear power plants are going to melt down when people just walk away from them, then that seems like a good idea. But it's not. So I was in that camp not long before, you know, before I learned about the aerosol masking effect. I was in that camp. I was keen on ripping it all down. Yeah. Why do you think I moved to the mud hut? I, I walked away from a six-figure, very privileged life to go live off the land because I thought that was the solution. And I was going to lead the way because as a renowned professor who wouldn't follow me, you know, fewer than one in 200 people who get a PhD in the natural sciences go on to become a full professor. I did that before I turned 40, which is incredibly rare. And so I just figured I go live off the grid. It's going to be, I'm going to be swamped with other people who are dashing to get away from the cities. It's a good thing nobody paid attention to me then. I just wish a few more people would pay attention to me now. <laughs> Maybe that's asking too much. So um, was it was it the anti-tech revolution? Why? Yes. Um, yes, the anti-tech revolution. Came out in 2015. And, and he was 2015. Mm -hmm. So that's eight years ago, roughly. Yes. Yeah. The anti-tech revolution. It's good stuff. If you don't know about aerosol masking and nuclear power plants. <laughs> but we know about those things. How inconvenient. There's a couple questions. And we'll have hundreds of Bhopals of chemical plants that will all break down and catch on fire, like what happened in Bhopal in India. Killed thousands of people. Right. No one went to jail. Right. Was it, wasn't that like 20,000 people or some ridiculous number? It was a lot. There's a lot of people still living with the physical um, debilitation ever since. Dow chemical. Yeah. So we had a couple of people ask about where you get, um, what, what's a good source of science information? So what websites do you go to? And is there something that you recommend? Uh, you know who's really good at this answer? Justin. Oh. <laughs> well, Justin's not with us. And, and he doesn't have a, a, well, a microphone going to my ear. 
thing. I you know I don't know how I come across the things like I come across. People send me things via email, mostly bullshit, but occasionally there's a good piece of information, and I use search engines and focus on abrupt, irreversible climate change. There's not a lot of that happening out there. I don't know how I come across the things I come across. They just sort of happen to me. Well, you, you do have subscriptions, don't you? And you look at, yeah. them. there's some papers, some journals that you look yes. at regularly. Yes, I look at some journals regularly, but climate change is a relatively new science. And so with the exception of journals like Nature Climate Change and Climate Change, there's the climate change papers will appear almost anywhere. And there are literally hundreds of peer reviewed journals out there. I don't know. I think it happens to me. Uh, I have a, I have a suggestion. I used to be a lab scientist and I kept my subscription to AAAS so I can read science magazine. It's very inexpensive to get one of the budget digital subscriptions. And it's very nice. I, I recommend it to people who are, you know, it, you can at least read the abstracts and the first couple paragraphs of a research article and get it unfiltered instead of after it's been filtered by somebody to make it more palatable. So that's what I recommend is an AAAS subscription. Right, and you can go to sciencemag.org to track that down. And that's where this, this recent paper that I've been talking about was published, Life Without Ice, was in Science, which is the flagship journal for AAAS. I would also like to recommend Michael Dowd, who spoke a little while ago. I'd like to recommend Michael's post-Doom conversations where people are having these conversations about how they found their way through this uh, nightmare. And uh, there's some really, really wonderful discussions there. One of the few advantages I have as, as a result of my emeritus status, emeritus means retired with honor, and that allows me access to anything that appears in the University of Arizona Library. And it's a major institution, a major science institution. So everything is there. So I have free access to all the journals. So I don't, I don't need to subscribe to any more. I can just find them all there. But other people are not so fortunate. So uh, going to getting a subscription to science is a good idea. Or you can just get a subscription to the Nature Bats last YouTube channel. You get everything you really need to know. <laughs> Tommy is who has the most questions tonight. Um, asks, how bad will the wildfires get in the coming decade? Well, I can answer that. There's probably not gonna be a decade, right? Right. <laughs> so, so don't worry. <laughs> Everything is going to get worse. And then just when you think it can't get any worse, it's going to get worse. That's been the story for, for me anyway, for more than 10 years. It was on June 20th, 2012, that I first wrote on the blog about abrupt irreversible climate change. And 10 and a half years, you can't tell me there haven't been significant changes since then. Mm -hmm. The main, no. the main change has been the feedback loops that are kicking in. Uh, in, in your um, Monster Climate Change essay, which has its own tab at the top of the, of the blog, um, there's over six dozen feedback loops. And I remember once you brought up the subject where you discussed that with Peter Wadhams, and Peter said, they're not additive, they're multiplicative. Right. And, you know, that's a mind fuck in its own. Right. And I stopped updating that when we moved to Belize in July, or no, made one trip back to the States, updated it in August of 2016, I think. So 
it hasn't been updated for a long time and it's still got a lot of stuff that's relevant. And didn't you just get interviewed about one of those uh, blog posts about the the gentleman who carefully planned his suicide? Oh, Martin Manley. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that interview is ever going to be released, but Martin Manley, there, there's a, a, a tab at the NatureVet's last blog at diamondperson.com that says something like considering suicide please read this or something like that and includes this incredibly detailed story written by martin manley in anticipation of his suicide when he turned 60 years of old he did it on his 60th birthday which really had me thinking when i turned 60 and for the several months after that that how thoughtfully he had considered whether his life was worth continuing and how thoughtful he was with respect to his family and friends who he left behind. Most people are not that thoughtful about it. So I encourage people to read that. For one thing, it'll keep you occupied for the next week or so, keep you out of trouble on other issues. And, and I don't recommend suicide. We're, we're so close to you don't even have to worry about it because we're losing habitat so rapidly around the globe. And so I'm not encouraging anybody to commit suicide, but when the situation gets bad enough, I, I wouldn't um, hold, I wouldn't consider it a bad idea for somebody to commit suicide if things get as ugly as I presume they will. Every morning I take a walk to Depot Town, which is just five minutes away. There's a train at 70 miles, 60, 70 miles an hour Amtrak that runs right through. It doesn't stop here. And there's, you know, I get within six feet of the train and I just put my hands over my heart and I just watch it go through. And for that day, I'm choosing life because it would very easy to just step out there if I ever wanted to. And I don't want to. I want to choose life. But my favorite piece of gallows humor that I'm grateful to you for, Guy, is that I will often say when somebody says anything about five years, 10 years down the road, I'll whisper to Connie, I'll say, yeah, unless we've all boiled like lobsters or starved by then. And that just keeps a little laughter there for me. Right. Oh, and, and you could actually cause the train to stop there in your town. Somebody actually did just two weeks ago. Somebody actually stepped out and got killed. And then the train stopped, didn't it? The, well, the train stopped a mile. <laughs> it took a mile for it to stop. But, <laughs> but yeah, it was a big deal in the community. Right. Um, uh, I, I got to go. Thanks, guys. This has been wonderful. Michael, good to see you on here. Thanks. Thank you. I highly recommend people check out Michael's post-doom conversation. Postdoom.com. Wonderful series. Thanks, bro. Thanks, brother. Uh, John Coviello had, a, had some nice words to say. Um, he says, good to hear both of you with Michael, Dowd, I mean, both Kevin and, and Guy. Uh, he says, three of his favorite people who are helping us through our ultimate calamity. It's very nice. Thank you, John. It's very nice work. Uh, Bernard Max, who uh, used to go by Obsolete Optics, or still does elsewhere. Um, are you familiar with the work of Kevin Blanche? Does that sound familiar to either of you? No, I thought that I was am. A what? Cooking technique. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> Sorry, I'm not familiar with the work of Kevin Blanche. Did I and I I was talking over you, Kevin. I am. Um he's um heavily involved in the anti-nuclear movement and um he can be very uh over he exaggerates and from my experience hmm. i think he exaggerates the fact that he has a phd and i'm pretty sure he doesn't as well <laughs> oh another paul beckwith <laughs> somebody in the chat on the YouTube chat says that um, they have a friend who was a 
worked on the trains and says that those suicide by trains really screws up the conductors and the train operators. And I I think that, um, you know, our friend Daniel here in the Zoom, if he's still on, uh, he worked for the uh, MTA for many years. Yes, uh, I have a lot of experience with um, suicide by train and it isn't pretty. And yeah, it wreaks havoc. You're talking about, uh, that's not a, uh, it's not a good, I wouldn't do it that way. No way in hell. Well, it seems like it's exactly the opposite of the approach Michael or Martin Manley took. Right? Yes. It's, yes. It's no, sort of spontaneous. Quick. There's not a lot of thought given. It's just a spontaneous action. Mm -hmm. Yes. Very messy. And yeah, it's messy. Unless Absolutely. you do a brainstorm. But it's, it's not instantaneous either, my Yeah. It's, it's very cruel to the first responders. Absolutely. Well, the person operating the, the train is immediately taken out of service and uh typically they're not back for months. Um, they go for uh, psychological testing and, and therapy. It's not an, and the worst is when, if uh, there were a lot of accidents where employees get hit as well. It's a very dangerous job. That's the worst of all. So if you're thinking of exiting, think twice about that one. <laughs> I'd say more than twice. Yeah. My my position is the same as guys. I have a very long list of people I'd like to see dead. And mine and guy's name ain't on the list. For one thing, when somebody I know commits suicide, I'm immediately pointed out as the as the cause. So I don't want anybody I know to commit suicide just because it, it reflects so badly on me. <laughs> oh. every time ZJ just brought up an interesting topic um, she writes I'm not sure if we understand the implications of grizzly bears having bird flu my money is on infectious disease related to warming climate and toxic environment taking this out do grizzly are grizzly bears having bird flu ZJ that's well, new it certainly could be that the small things will cause our demise. You know, the influences and the microbes and the bacteria wouldn't surprise me at all. For one thing, they've got us seriously outnumbered. That's really weird. Uh, can someone... I have a blog post about pestilence coming from the melting cryosphere. That's already underway. Absolutely. Smallpox is back. Right. Yes. All those diseases we thought we took care of decades ago. They're back. <laughs> They're back. I just saw Poltergeist for the first time last week. It was fun to watch. <laughs> um, yeah, that's really interesting, ZJ. That's really screwed up. So if if bird flu is now in minks and grizzlies, it's just you know a matter of time before it's in humans. Right, and that's going to stop the grizzlies from flying, isn't it? <laughs> or laying eggs. <laughs> just recently, an adult and a child were killed by a polar bear in Wales. Wow. That seems a little out of place. Yeah. But you know, a all of these organisms, of when you run out of food, when you run out of habitat where you live, of course you're going to become desperate, go someplace else. People are doing it. Non you and I got to interview Corey Bradshaw about his paper on extinction cascades, and he talked about that. 
about how species were migrating and just um, displacing in indigenous species. Right. And here's that paper, part of the nature series. So it's good stuff. Turn off your um, background thing. It's causing an issue. But... Oh, turn off my background thing. Yeah, your green screen. Uh... <laughs> Technologically challenged. Let's see. <laughs> Welcome, Elle Harris, to Climate Defenders. It's great to have you on board as a supporter and part of the family commenting here. This is great. I just want to thank everybody for showing up tonight and participating and being really wonderful I and mean, pretty well behaved. Way to go. It's a small community and we want to be kind to each other as we exit the planet. <laughs> I mean, it's one thing to joke about death and dying, but it's another to be a jerk to somebody. <laughs> I don't, I don't know how to do whatever you want me to do. B, B put an interesting observation that happened to her son in the uh, Zoom chat. Oh, thanks. Um, this is the same son who moved two months ago to Auckland, New Zealand. But actually, I think it was 2021. He was, he, he was a farmer and in very good shape and was out trying to cool down his chickens during a bad heat wave. And this is Portland, Oregon, okay? Just outside of Portland. And he was drinking like crazy because we're from Arizona. We know about heat prostration. We're, we've all, my whole family, we've all experienced it. So he was very careful, but it got him anyway. He, he went in collapsed on the floor, stayed there, immobile, sick, until his wife got home from work and took him to the emergency room. And they revived him, but it was clearly a result of the wet bulb temperature. Uh, and that was, that was a couple of years ago, guys. I mean, it's definitely happening here in the Northwest. So just thought I should tell you. Yes. Yeah, one reason he moved to New Zealand. <laughs> Every day, somebody writes to me, at least one somebody writes to me and says, when am I going to be able to tell that climate change is happening? <laughs> so apparently everybody has to collapse in a heap before they're going to get it. And every day somebody asks you, how many, how many days or years do we have? Someone is asking that in the chat right now. Of course <laughs> they are. Hilarious. Everybody asks that every day. I, and my new my new go-to response is you have three minutes. And with every breath, you have a reset. So shut up. I, I always tell people to just watch for the ice-free Arctic because that will trigger the collapse of the ability to grow grains at scale. Yeah. And who knows? I mean, that will take some time to trigger to properly trigger into the system but it happens quickly i mean yeah. look at look at the prices in the grocery stores right now because of avian flu the egg prices have shot up um it's it's really not biden's fault <laughs> he's we can blame him for a lot of other things but it's not his fault <laughs> the price of food has gone up you know we were um talking about the, the really interesting thing that many people who are very heavily into prepping, which is something that we did, and Guy had this beautiful off-grid mud hut, is that you think you're the star of the movie. You're the one who's going to survive. Yeah. Everybody's going to be the last survivor, the star of the show. Yeah. That's what everybody thinks. You're Mad Max. Right. But uh, in reality, you're a red shirt. <laughs> you're the you're the extra in the back where the, the lava is coming and burning you up. 
<laughs> so, some of you the might wild not, birds are picking you up and carrying you off. Some of you might not know the red shirts, but on Star Trek, if you were wearing a red shirt and you were on the away team, you ain't coming back. <laughs> Daniel, I think, has something to say. Go, Daniel. Yeah, um, speaking to abrupt climate change, I was watching a short doc the other night, and uh, they have found uh, woolly mammoths still with buttercups in their mouths, mm -hmm. food in their bellies, flash frozen in the middle of eating. That's abrupt climate change. Right. I was, and it made me wonder if the very opposite might happen. If we just wake up one day and it's 5C warmer than yesterday and it's over. I, I don't think it'll be nearly as comfortable as freezing to death, though. If we see the large discharge of methane from the East Siberian Arctic Shelf or anywhere in that region for that matter, um, I think that we will see those kind of radical changes literally overnight, within a few days. And also uh, one point I'd make is that uh, um, Shakova and, and Similitov mentioned that they could uh, conceive of a 50 billion ton, 50 gigaton uh, discharge of methane at any time. That was 10 years ago. They said that that was possible. And uh, Peter Wadhams corrected it in one of his interviews, and he said he thinks it could be hundreds, plural, not 50. Right. Yeah, it's always worse than the original person says. And he, you know, he's well qualified to make this, that kind of call. You know, the man spent more time under the Arctic ice than uh, any other human that I know of. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, we're past an hour here, folks. So um, I'm going to wind this down and get ready. Final, final question. Anybody? Let's see. Any burning questions? that I missed in this very exciting chat, live chat here. Oh, B has her hand up, fire away. It is. I didn't want to ask because you're, you're going to think I'm a crazy conspiracy theorist. But <laughs> the other day I was looking at a weather map where it showed how uh, Russia, near Moscow, sort of that area, was, I think it was like 40, 40 degrees Celsius, not sure, um, colder than in Germany, like around Berlin. And they showed, it showed like progressions of clouds and it looked like pulses. It looked like somebody had intentionally cooled off Russia. And I thought, oh, how, we can't do that. But I looked it up and supposedly we can. And I just kind of wondered if you had heard about this method of sprinkling stuff in the clouds to make them more reflective, to keep out the heat in a confined area. Yes. And, and would the government do that? Would our government? I mean, maybe I've heard of HARP, but I'm just not trusting our government. I like I, I'm not trusting the Navy to tell us if there's no real ice in the Arctic. I don't believe they'll tell us. I think they're they're gonna hedge. And 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 I think we could be our government could be intentionally using weapons of weather. Am I nuts? Is this possible? Yes, you're nuts. And yes, it's possible. <laughs> Both at the same time. I'm exhibit A. Yes, spraying material into the stratosphere is the approach forwarded by Professor David Keith at Harvard. And the reason that it has appeal is that it hasn't been fully tested yet. And most importantly, it would have to be applied very frequently, like every few weeks or months. Nobody really knows. He was set to conduct some experiments 
and those have been delayed at least until next year, as I understand it. So he didn't, his research team wasn't ready to implement the experiments yet. But it could very well be that the US military, I mean, I wouldn't put anything past them. It could very well be that they have preliminary information from the laboratory, not even from a field experiment. And so they're out there testing any number of ideas. So yes, this is a way to reduce first local and regional temperatures. And then ultimately the idea is to cool the planet, but I don't think we have enough data to indicate whether that can be successfully applied. Maybe that's what the military is up to, conducting their own experiments. Nothing would surprise me. I would expect it. Right. Somebody wants to know if the melting ice caps would mitigate ocean acidification. I don't know how that would happen. Me neither. Is it not true that when those carbon dioxide molecules are in the ocean, they don't care how much water is around them? Well, I don't know the effects of more fresh water, mm -hmm. more saline water than salt water. I don't know what the implications are. Kevin, do you have any idea? No, so I can't get either. Yeah. I, at least of our worries. Seems that might be the one case where dilution is not the solution. <laughs> to pollution. To pollution. Right. So I think we should wind this thing down. Thank you, everybody, for participating. And maybe if we can get our act together here in Vermont, we can make this happen again at some point in the near future. But I wouldn't hold my breath. And uh, as I sign off, I'll just bring up a, uh, some, something that Guy and I said and Pauline just before we went live, is that uh, Paul Ehrlich uh, from Stanford University has a new book out, and got, Guy's got his copy and mine's on the way, and we'll probably uh, contact Paul and see if he wants to come and discuss the book with us, and if that happens, uh, Guy will be posting it on um, Nature Bats Last, and I'll do the same on my um, website. Mind you, this is from a 90-year-old man who is publishing what must be his 30th or 40th book. This is an autobiography that begins with a relatively short comment from his daughter, born in 1955. That's as far as I've gotten in the book. It just showed up yesterday. I'd like to talk to him again, because I always do like my times when I hang out with him. But also, you and him are probably the most attacked scientists on the planet. You know, Paul's been attacked all my life. He wrote The Population Bomb when I was eight years old. Right. Yes. And, and I should point out that he and Anne both wrote The Population Bomb, but the publisher wouldn't allow Anne's, Paul's wife, wouldn't allow Anne's name on the book because women don't know anything about population. Paul said it was his biggest scientific regret that he allowed them to take her name off the cover. That's pretty amazing. Anyway, they've subsequently published probably 30 books together. So I think they're all caught up now. Thanks, everybody. We're going to turn this thing off now. Catch you next Another time. Another program, folks. Until the next time. Thank, Thank you, Kevin. You very Appreciate much. you joining in. Let me ask Thank the three members to stay on while you're there. Don't go away. We're gonna. We're just gonna say goodbye on the YouTube channel to everyone. Have a great evening, everyone. I just have to make it end. <laughs> That's the fun part. So yeah, so now we're gonna make this end and we're gonna sign off. And I just have to find the right button and I can't find the right button. It's here somewhere. <laughs> it's hilarious. It's the most beautiful thing. I have no idea why they make it so hard to do. There.
I paused the recording. You, you that stopped helps. that recording, but we're still live on the YouTube channel. I understand. You're so cute. <laughs> Let's see. Mm. Hot mic time. You need a chicken to walk across the keyboard. That'll do it. Uh, that's <laughs> right. All right. Bye, everyone. <laughs> bye, bye. Cool hanging out with you all, and thanks for your time, Bear. You made good contributions. Thank you. Take care.